Good morning. Welcome to this, the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. We continue to observe and study and uh, imagine through the uh, words of the gospel lesson, particularly, uh, the, um, uh, the kingdom's coming, God's uh, engagement of, uh, of the world. Um, so listen closely. It, uh, it's a message of hope. Uh, it's also a message of, uh, clearly, of um, truth and realism. So listen up closely. Um, in the same way, uh, I am eager that you uh, uh, be sustained in your um, shelter in place, uh, that you make sure you take all the necessary provisions uh, for health and wholeness. We did receive this week a notion that one of our members has uh, contracted the, uh, the coronavirus. So it is not, we are not exempt. Uh, we need to be very cautious and very clear that our, um, our duty, not only uh, to ourselves, but also uh, particularly to our neighbor, is to maintain the, uh, the protections and the necessities of, of being um, careful um, with what we do and how we engage others. So masks and rubber gloves and distancing and disinfectants are always important, necessary tools for us to maintain our own and our neighbor's health. So please uh, take note. You also um, have on your screen uh, a, uh, a place where you can make uh, contributions to the life of the church, uh, to our ongoing services here, and our Bible studies, and our support of various organizations that are doing uh, the hard labors of maintaining uh, uh, maintaining the wholeness and the dignity of our brothers and sisters. So, um, please be generous. Uh, in um, I guess uh, we have a, a list of prayers that we have received this past week. And I assure you, we not only will include them in our prayers today, but also we'll be uh, providing. Uh, engaging and uh, keeping them in the prayers all through this week. Um, if there are prayer requests, please uh, send them in. Uh, we could do that through our um, uh, admin um, address for St. Paul's, um, or give a call or give a, uh, uh, an email to me uh, at solberg uh, at stpaulus.org. Um, in any case, uh, I am delighted to uh, share this morning with you and to be, uh, uh, to be surrounded uh, virtually um, through the Spirit with all the saints that are gathered around, uh, around Facebook this morning. So, uh, blessings and may your, may your worship uh, be spirit-filled and uh, may it be um, efficacious for us all. So, let us begin with singing the first hymn, Rise Up. O saints of God. Sustain. 
Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Amen. have mercy. For the peace from above and for salvation for all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have, Lord, mercy. have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. 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 Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom, the kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom, that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. first reading, the epistle reading, is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Romans in the 8th chapter. <clears throat> Paul writes, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the, mind, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorifies. What then are we to say to, about all these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Did he who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not also with him give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of God? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword? For as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. 
in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth not anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This ends the first lesson. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the, in the Gospel according to St. Matthew in the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus puts before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that somebody took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make their nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without parables, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth and speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which somebody found and hid, and then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that is thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw the bad out. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be gnashing and weeping. Have you understood all this? Jesus asked. They answered, oh, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained in the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure that which is new and what is old. Then when Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Christianity, like most religions, has been domesticated. It has been neutralized. It has been tamed. It has been put in its place in the service of we human beings. That may be a rather harsh judgment to make. I don't make it lightly. And yet, I must, I must say out loud that given all the evidence that I have seen, or that is somewhere around us, historically and in the present, Christianity like most religions, has been domesticated and, the, and the, the, the sharpness and radicalness of it has been deleted, has been put into, basically, into the service of our human whims and desires and our struggle for power. 
Now, it's not, this isn't something new. This has been going on for a long, in fact, this has been going on since the beginning of the world. Beginning of time, since the foundation of the earth. This, all you need to do is take a look at some of the, some of the history. I mean, you talk about domestication. That just basically means that the power is, is, is neutralized. It is tamed. You know, I see that, uh, that uh, little commercial about dog food with, with the wolf jumping, jumping through the, the, the woods and, and, and then the frame comes on about this dog food. And it, the wolf basically gets turned into a puppy. That's domestication. I mean, it's most clearly seen in in um, um, in uh, you know agricultural things and in you know breeding and in uh, you know, those kinds of arenas in the nature. We 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 domesticate the wild things so that they become a service to us, or they become our possessions, or they become. Uh, controlled by our whim and our desires. Nature provides certainly an opportunity to domesticate. In fact, God even said, go and, and you know, uh, use, the, use the creation. But it is the domestication of Christianity and of so many other religions that have been probably the most consequential in our human history, come to mind, you know the uh, the, uh, the the domestication of, of the the use of Christianity in the in the annals of history have been blatant and brutal. Think uh, think the um, um, Inquisition. It was done in the name of God. It was done basically. Because we had this sense, or the church had its sense, that it had, had, had a, an insight and it could take on the power of God and be justified by it. And then, of course, there's the, the, uh, the, um, the, the great um, enslavement of human beings during the early part of our own national history. It was all done on the basis of this domesticated Christianity, and it goes on and on. I mean, you know, even the even the uh, the, the, the um, uh, genocide that was perpetrated against the American Indian was justified because we had somehow this domesticated God who said, "Hey, you have the opportunity to take control of the of the." Of the this expanding nation that you had every right under God's direction. That's the consequence of domestication, this Christianity stuff. We are not exempt. I mean, those are the big ticket, and there are hundreds of other examples of, of, the, of the significant damage and degradation to human, human dignity and life that our domesticating of Christianity has engendered. Those are the small, those are the big tickets, but you know, you take a look. <laughs> uh, you know, the, uh, uh, it's interesting, at, at one point, I'm not sure, maybe it was Martin Luther King who said, you know, Sunday morning is the most segregated moment of the entire week. Is that God's intent? Oh, we gather together, though, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we basically get together pretty much in segregated order. Or we go to church and we then, uh, you know, we even commune with Jesus. And then by afternoon, we're talking smack about our neighbor. Or worse. I mean, it's, uh, this, this domestication stuff basically takes out all the radical senses of Jesus' teachings and his, and his, and his, um, um, his demonstrations of God's intent for the world. And this, uh, this is a, a, a 
Jesus calls for forgiveness. He calls for, um, for radical inclusiveness of people. He calls for life. He calls for uh, the abundance of, 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 of care and compassion. These are radical calls. And yet, I hardly see much evidence of those radical notions. Christianity has been domesticated. You know, I've been, uh, I've been part of the church now for almost, I've <laughs> worked in the church, you know, hey, this is sort of uh, uncomfortable even to say it. I've worked in the church for almost a half a century. Do you know that? Half a century. And I haven't seen much by way of God's intent, God's working out his radical commendation being, being seen or evidenced in the work of the church. Harsh, maybe, but I think accurate something that we really need to repent of. But that's not the point that I have this morning. The point is we basically have domesticated this, this Christianity stuff, and we think we have it under control. We think somehow we have, we have, we have uh, had the right and the privilege of God in our back pocket, and we can act on the basis of, of, of being justified in all that we do. And this is this has been going on. I mean, this is one. I think one of the one of the, uh, the contentions Jesus says about about teaching in parables. He says he teaches in parables uh, to reveal that which has been true since the foundation of the world. This has been going on forever. Resistance and. And a, and a desire to take control of God's power, his privilege, his position. Take control of it, domesticate it, to make it use for us. Now it is in this context that Jesus tells these parables. And these parables really are, are no more, they aren't moral tales to somehow give you or teach you or or have you change your ways? This is not this is not a, a teaching moment that somehow we can we can we can improve our lives. That's not what parables are about. Parables, the parables that Jesus tells today, are parables about how God acts, about how God engages, about how God works. He, God, you know, it's amazing. God has never ever given up on us. God has never abandoned us. He's never walked away. He continues to seek ways of engaging this world that wants so much to be in control and to run things, even in God's name. So he tells a parable about a mustard seed. A tiny little Mustard seed. And these are even even with the mustard seed, we've domesticated. We oh, everybody thinks, isn't it a nice sweet parable? Oh, a mustard seed grows from just a little little teeny bit into a great tree, and the birds come and nest in it. Isn't that wonderful? Well, indeed, in Jesus' day, and I, even in our own, mustard seed is a weed. It's a downright dandelion weed. Not only is it the weed, but it is a, a pernicious little devil. It grows and it infiltrates and it engages the whole of a, of a, of a garden, of a, of a field. I mean, you know, for, for somebody in Jesus' day, a, a, a farmer, if he heard Jesus say, this guy went out and planted planted mustard seed in his in his yard or in his garden. It would have been crazy. You don't do that. You don't you don't drop a mustard seed in the middle of oh what we have seen as a pretty lawn as a nice uh, growth of, 
of, of uh, wheat. These weeds, this mustard seed weed, is something that Jesus plants <laughs> in the midst of all our, all our beautifully tailored and wonderfully controlled environment. And it, this mustard seed is the way God works. I, again, I don't see many mustard seeds in the church, but I do see, and this is, I think, one of the, one of the marvelous um, opportunities to celebrate God's intent. You know, weeds, you can't beat a weed. You can't somehow stuff them out. They're always weeds. And you can, you can pull them and they pop up somewhere else. You can, you can, you can poison them with Roundup and they happen somewhere else. They, uh, they, you can't get rid of Weeds win. Uh, even in the best of horticulturist uh, intent, weeds win. You can't get rid of them. They keep on coming in. That's what God's kingdom is. That's what God intends. That's why he tells this story. Again, I don't see many, many weeds of, of, of God's expression, God's intent um, in, the, in the institutions of our religious organization. But I do see the seed being planted time and time and time again. Things that you and I ought to celebrate and ought to, ought to, ought to at least admit that God continues to, to engage the, the, the world engage the culture. You know, as far as I'm concerned, God planted the mustard seed of Black Lives Matter. It's a mustard seed. It gets planted in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a world that is in love with racism, that, is, that, is, that has shaped its life and, and substance Segregated and and a, a sense of, of um, supremacy. That's the way the world acts. God plants the the seed of, of Black Lives Matter in the midst of that, so it begins to infiltrate and engage. God doesn't give up. He doesn't walk away. He plants seeds, and as Black Lives Matter is one place where He has planted the seed. And even despite our, our desire to hang on and to, and to maintain our, uh, our, our white privilege by some of the most barbaric ways. I mean, you know, it used to be Jim Crow, it used to be lynchings, it used to be voter suppression, all those kinds of things. But the seed has sprouted. Black lives matter. Or take... Or take uh, 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 the, the mustard seed that was planted in what is it, 1985 at the Stonewall riot in New York City. I don't know if anybody remembers that one. But if you're gay, if you are a part of the LGBT community, that is the seed that was planted by God. Into a, into a culture that has, that has stigmatized and has, has denigrated and has murderously treated gay brothers and sisters. <coughs> and yet here, this seed planted in, in, that, in that riot, in that, in that bloody riot in New York City, that was a seed that was planted. And you know, have you seen the growth? Have you seen it? I mean, it is, it is from stigmatization and, and, and reaction and, and uh, undignifying language to now there's legal marriage. Think of uh, uh, Think of the, uh, the, uh, the, the challenge and the, and the transformation and that seed growing that from, from the, the, the 
total rejection of the of the LGBTQ community, then I we've just seen that a gay man has been running, did run, for the highest office in our land as a president of the United States. And he almost made it. You know, he made an end. But it is the seed that continues to grow. A mustard seed. God hasn't given up on making his intention, his justice, his, his evaluating and his dignifying of human beings. That doesn't quit. Despite what we might want to we, we might want to engage. You know, I, this, I may, may be overstepping it here, but in some ways, I, it may be that this coronavirus is a mustard seed. For it challenges, it challenges deeply where your compassion is, where your sense of, of civic responsibility is. Not only that, but uh, it has, it has. I think, probably more, more singularly than almost anything else, has, has exposed the danger that is, that is, that is rampant in our, in our, in our political and, and cultural notions who sits in the White House. It is a challenge again to the, the kind of capitalistic sensibilities of a, of, a, of, a, of a medical system that is built on profit, not the care of people, and on the incredible system that, that grinds up people and, and spits them out because they have no money. These, those are the, are the, are the mustard seeds that indeed God has planted. It's not, it's not rocket science here. It's not, uh, it is a way of knowing. It's a way of seeing. It's a way of hearing these parables. You know, it's, 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 like, it's like the coming of Jesus. God's gift, God's amazing revelation of his love for the world, and what do they do to him? They try to gut him out. They try to pluck him out. They try to somehow uh, void him, neutralize him, domesticate him. And they hung him on a tree. And they kill him. And yet, did God throw in the towel? No. <laughs> yes, Jesus rose from the dead. Not with vengeance in his heart, but with a desire that that the, that the intent and the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ and of God's, God's intent for the world should be revealed. He'll win. He will win. The mustard seed will win. That is the, the, the message and the power and the substance and the, and the reality that is carried by these amazing parables. Don't ever lose hope. God will win. God will bring his kingdom into being. So if you look around and you are, you are broken and hopeless and despairing or somehow there is a, a sense, not just, not just culturally and politically, but as, as, a, as a human being, as one individual, God will win. He will bring his intent, his kingdom, into your heart. He has done so in Jesus, and he will continue to unfold. He will continue to plant seeds, mustard seeds, that will indeed survive, grow, and bring life to the world. He or she who has ears to hear, let him hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let us confess together our common faith in the, in the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic, Catholic Church, the communion, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us gather our hearts and minds and, and energy and spirit, allowing the Spirit to Pray on our behalf, but let us gather our hearts together in prayer. Oh, gracious Father, we give thanks. We give thanks for your never-ending love, for your faithfulness to us, for your unwillingness to walk away, to your faithful and steadfast love for us all, despite despite us. We give thanks that you have never given up and that in that promise and in that amazing reality we might breathe in life into our hearts that mustard seed might be sown so that that kingdom that you desire for us might grow and abound within us and within the world that you love so dearly. Give us hope. Give us, give us a sense of empowerment through that hope that we might engage and celebrate and even be your hands and your feet in this world bringing forth that kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. In all Gracious Father, we pray for those who are dear to us, who are in need of your particular mercies and grace, your healing might, your comfort, your strengthening. We pray for life where there are shadows of death. We pray for hope where there is despair. We pray for peace. There seems to be contention and anger. We pray today, Lord, particularly for our dear ones. We pray for Gwen today. Touch and heal and sustain her. We pray for Maureen. May you be kind and provide healing and relief in the midst of her suffering. We pray for Lynn with those disease that challenges health and wholeness might be might be ended, might be cured, might be brought under control. We pray for Cindy and for Nancy. We pray, Lord, that you will pour your spirit upon them, that they may know the bounty and the blessing of your presence in their lives. We pray for Doug. Pray that you might heal and protect him from wounds. And we pray as well for Emerson. We pray for the Cher family who grieve deeply. We pray for homeless that we forget about so readily, that we dismiss so, e so, so easily. We pray, Father, that we not surround them with our stigmatization and our dismissal, but that you hold them fast in your mercy and give us the opportunity to care and to provide compassionate care for young, for old, 
for those who are part of our congregation, for Robert, for Rick, for Scott, for Donnie, for Wesley, for Philip, and for all those, Lord, that we now name before you in our hearts. Minister to them, pour your spirit upon them, that they might hear the words of encouragement and hope, and they might receive the power of your spirit for their life, for their future, and for their way of hopefulness. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, Gracious Father, we pray for our country. We pray, dear Father, that in the midst of these days of shadows and difficulties and medical and economic tragedies and forces, that we render ourselves available for your hopefulness and do our part in the work of your kingdom. We pray for those that are on the front lines, those that minister, those that, those that care so deeply for those who are afflicted. We pray for those, dear Father, who do suffer and who grasp for breath. We pray for those families that bitterly hold the grief in our hearts. And we pray, dear Father, for those folks in refugee camps on the borders of our country and others, immigrants who are again dismissed and sacrificed and shunned aside. We pray, dear Father, that the seeds, the mustard seeds of your kingdom might find and might uplift and invade their lives so that they might know your good measure and your good grace and your intent for them. Bring peace where there is war. Bring an end to violence. May your kingdom come and may we who hear the kingdom celebrate and rejoice in your care and your love, your victory for us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them to the, the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Indeed, it is right and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Holy Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection open to, open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with Mary Magdalene and with Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth, sea, and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, with cherubim and teraphim, we laud and magnify your glorious name and join their unending hymn. 
Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love for us, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who, on the cross, opened his arms to all in the night in which he was betrayed. Our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that by this communion we may know the unity that we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through him, with him, in, him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessing our truth.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. to have been able to share this time with you and to share the Spirit's life and the bounty of the kingdom that continues to prosper and continues to be planted and continues as God's intent and love for us. May you take these words of hope and this word of encouragement. Break your patterns, but live in God's mustard seed growing as you uh, as you enter and as that seed grows in you be generous touch the buttons on your screen give and contribute wildly to this ministry so that we might so that God's kingdom might prosper in our work may your blessing be all this week we hold you in fast and prayer and we pray for our whole world, for our brothers and sisters, wherever they may be. God's blessing be upon them and upon you. In Jesus' name. Amen.